Well, thank you, Nelson, for that very nice introduction and also for helping to recruit me to UCSF. I, it was a great move in, in uh, my career. I caught this beauty in, the, in Golden Gate Park with my iPhone uh, just outside the Japanese tea garden, and I needed a new first slide, so I thought I'd put that in. Um, so we, again, subjects and, and their families became interested uh, and because of a collaboration with my longtime colleague Chris Jones at, UC, uh, at uh, University of Utah, became interested in behavioral genetics. Up to this point we had done only disease genetics, but uh, we identified and characterized these very interesting families with circadian phenotypes that were, don't appear to be diseases, although they are troubling to some of the individuals. But this is incredibly important because our sleep and our circadian regulation through evolution has become intimately tied to all elements of our biochemistry and metabolism. And of course, we, we know about sleep disorders and the problems that, uh, that these cause for some patients, but, but there are also incredible links between circadian function and sleep with cancer, chronic sleep deprivation, shift work, for example, leads to increased risks of many different kinds of cancers, uh, affective disorders and other psychiatric, uh, neuropsychiatric phenotypes, uh, immune disorders, pain disorders, and even vascular disorders. So, so understanding sleep and being able to regulate it and improve its quality in human uh, beings will have, I, I, I believe, a profound effect on all elements of medicine, all areas of medicine. And so the first familial, for, now we've known for decades or for centuries that there's some people who are more morning and some who are more evening. We've known about natural short sleepers and natural long sleepers. But the first report of a sleep or circadian phenotype that's familial in human subjects was not reported until 1999. I find that really pretty remarkable, but it was a spectacular and huge Utah pedigree that we identified and characterized that began our whole uh, uh, story uh, that I'll tell you about today. And what I'd like to do is give you an overview of the field of human circadian rhythms and where I think that's going and what uh, exciting things I, I think we can expect, um, but also to touch on some recent specific findings to, to show you how we can go from mutations to drill down to understanding biology. Now, a huge amount of really wonderful work began with Seymour Benzer and continues today in many labs studying flies and also rodents. And because it's easy to do, folks in this field have, beginning with Seymour Benzer and Ron Kanapka, began looking at rhythms arrhythm for a, in ENU mutagenesis screens, looking for arrhythmic mutants, short and long period mutants, by, at, by measuring activity rhythms across uh, uh, time in flies that were first acclimated to a light-dark cycle and then released into constant darkness. We can't do that in humans, or the, the studies of periodicity, uh, of period length in humans are uh, Herculean studies and are prohibitively expensive. So we've really focused on these families that presented because of their altered phase, morning larks, the early birds that go to sleep late, uh, early and, and wake up early. So I'll come back to this. The fact that we're actually phenotyping something different, it, it's going to be related to the work and the genes identified in fly, flies and rodents, but it's also going to teach us some novel things that would not be seen in these screens because we're looking at slightly different uh, or very different phenotypes. Now, I don't have time to go into all the details, and this slide is not even complete, but these are genes that we in, in humans, but also others in flies and, and rodents have identified that constitute the core cell autonomous clock, which is a 24 hour, uh, an approximately 24 hour, hour clock that depends on this negative transcriptional translational feedback loop where period and cry proteins in, in mammals, period and timeless in flies, feedback and interact with a heterodimeric partner that activates their gene transcription and, and inhibits gene transcription. So, so this is a negative transcriptional translational feedback loop and 
to go through this whole feedback loop requires approximately 24 hours. And there are interlocked positive feedback loops like the one shown here, but the details of this are not important for the purpose of today's talk. <clears throat> so in the human circadian system, there are different elements. The, the forward screens in, hum in, in rodents and uh, flies have focused on core clock genes, and this has been a hugely successful uh, endeavor and uh, has really been instrumental to our understanding of circadian rhythm genetics and, and biology. And much of this is conserved through mammals and even humans. But there are also some very notable uh, divergences in, in the biology and genetics of clock function. So that is exciting and interesting also. And then in addition to the clock ticking in our cells and the clock master clock ticking in our brain, we have to be able to adjust to differences in the environment in terms of light and in modern days to traveling across time zones. Uh, so we need to be able to entrain our clock to changes in the day, in the, in the light input of the day. And then we also have to couple this clock to outputs like all of physiology, immune system regulation, cell cycle regulation, sleep, wake, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, again, I'm going to keep emphasizing this. The flies and mouse screens have focused largely on clock, but I think what we're going to find in our human studies, because we're looking at a different phenotype, will overlap with that, but will also identify novel entrainment and, and clock output uh, pathways. And so that's just shown here. Uh, because we're studying phase, we believe, we know that period alterations can lead to alterations of sleep phase. Um, but uh, unlike in these model systems, we think we'll also get other stuff because uh, these screens have not looked at entrainment or output coupling. So <clears throat> my colleague, Ing Wei Fu, who, who Nelson mentioned, and I work in three main phenotypes in this domain. One is advanced sleep phase, the morning larks. Another that I won't talk about today is delayed sleep phase or the night owls. And there, we have strong genetic alleles, autosomal dominant, highly penetrant families with this phenotype. And, and we know from fly and mouse genetics that mutating different circadian genes in different ways can often give to op lead to opposite phenotypes. And so we expect we'll be able to identify genes and mutations here as well. And then Ingwei uh, first was the first to report a familial form of natural short sleep where people sleep a lot less than the average person and are incredibly productive and seem to be very healthy and, and, uh, um, and to survive their entire lives sleeping a lot less than the average person in this room sleeps. So advanced sleep phase syndrome was known in, in the sleep uh, uh, classification scheme and it, it was a simple definition. If someone came into the clinic and they complained about getting up too early uh, falling asleep too early, uh, waking up too early, uh, but had normal sleep quality and quantity, then this was called advanced sleep phase syndrome of aging because it affects this phenotype, getting up early and falling asleep early, is very common in as many as a third of people who are 65, and it gets even more common as people get older. Many of these people are not troubled by it, so they would never be called ASPS. But if one of these subjects comes into the clinic and says, I don't like this, I'm retired and I want to sleep in, but I can't stay asleep, then that would be classified by a sleep uh, medicine doc as advanced sleep phase syndrome. And so that, this is just saying that, uh, again, normal sleep duration and, and quality are uh, important in making this diagnosis. Now, the fact that we know almost nothing about sleep and what it is is characterized by the kind of figures that you find in papers modeling, you know, how sleep advances <laughs> over the course of aging. So, but it is true that we sleep deeply less. We, we spend less time in deep sleep uh, as we get older and different forms of sleep like slow wave sleep and uh, different slow wave sleeps and REM sleep, you know, change. But, but you know, the, the imprecision of a diagram of this type and the, and the horrible choice of colors emphasizes how little we, we understand about, about what sleep is and what it is for. So um, 
we've done extensive work. The first two genes that we cloned, the first by positional cloning and the second by candidate uh, gene screening, uh, we've done extensive work, and one of them is one of the is a homolog of the Dros Drosophila period gene, the first Drosophila gene cloned, and it is a substrate for this kinase which we cloned, and uh, and we have multiple alleles in different human families, and and I'm not going to talk uh, any more about these. I'm going to talk about two more recent stories that were just published uh, a couple of months ago and a couple of weeks ago. And, and just give you an example of a uh, taste of some of the families that we have. This was a particularly interesting family to us. In, in our FASP family collection, we have, you know, there's depression is common and you see it in some families. But in this family, all three of the affected individuals had seasonal affective uh, disorder that responded very dramatically to Lexapro and they had uh, missense variants in the PER3 gene. So here's that small family. Now, the phenotyping of, the, of these families is extremely intensive, and so, and, and we often don't have access to real extended families, and so many of our families are small like this, and the genetics is not sufficient to prove causality. But in this family, there's a proline to alanine variant at this position and a histidine to arginine variant, two amino acids downstream. These two variants are on the same allele, and they are in the public domain in the exact database at a very low frequency. Um, and, but what was interesting in screening candidate genes by sequencing, we identified the, this allele in these three affected members of this family. And so what we always do in, in these cases is then to make a mouse model, and for many years up until more recently when CRISPR-Cas9 uh, became available, we focused on making back transgenics because it was easy, it, you didn't get huge overexpression, and all the regulatory elements tend to be in place for proper expression and splicing. And without going into a lot of detail, let me focus first of all on a surprising finding in these mice that these mice when released into constant darkness didn't have a difference in period. All of our FA, the, the, the other alleles in PER2 and CK1 delta that we've identified, the mice that we've characterized have had short periods, which is one way that we and others had predicted that you could get advanced sleep phase by having a clock that's ticking too quickly. And these mice clearly don't have that. But they do have an altered period under conditions of constant light, which is very abnor uh, abnormal situation to put humans or mice in. This is relevant, actually, though, to patients in the ICU and, you know, who are subjected to lights 24 hours a day very often. Um, but this suggests an altered uh, uh, and asymmetrical effect on the entraining uh, effect of light on uh, mouse uh, circadian function. Now, the period proteins and the cryptochrome proteins inhibit their own transcription, and so uh, 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 Lo Ying Zhang, who did these experiments, showed that the mutant PER3 has reduced repressor activity uh, in, in this particular assay, and that the stability of the PER3 mutant protein is less. And this is, so this is in an experiment where she's looking at flag tag PER3 after treating cells with uh, cyclohexamide and following them at different time points showing that the decay of protein levels was steeper in the mutant versus the wild type protein. And this was much more pronounced in the nuclear fraction of cells, but it was also present in cytoplasmic. These are statistically significant differences in the nuclear and cytoplasmic uh, fractions. And th so those were experiments in in vivo in flies, in, uh, in transgenic flies, and then here is an, an experiment in mice showing that uh, similarly the transgenic mice that carried the mutant transgene shown in the black bar here had uh, lower PER2, uh, PER3 uh, nuclear pro uh, protein levels in the nucleus than the wild type transgenic animals. So here's a wild type mouse, a wild type per three transgenic mouse and a mutant per three transgenic mouse. And these lower protein levels in the mutant were despite having higher mutant gene expression as assayed by quantitative 
RT-PCR with uh, markers for different exons in the gene. So this is not an effect on, on mRNA levels, but rather on protein stability. <clears throat> and now there are three, unlike flies, which have one per gene, the mammals have three per homologs. And per one and two are, are thought by people in the field to be the really relevant ones for clock. And I don't understand why. Per, when per three is knocked out, when per one and two are knocked out, these animals become arrhythmic. Uh, but when per three is knocked out, they don't become arrhythmic, but they have subtle but real shortening of the circadian period. So this is clearly a circadian gene, but because the effects are a lot smaller than with per one and two, it's been largely ignored by people in the circadian field as a relevant circadian gene. And so we were intrigued when we found uh, genetic variants associated with the phenotype in, in these families. But interestingly, and, and these proteins can repress, each of these homologs can repress the expression of all the other per homologs, of the other two per homologs. And, and Loying showed that the wild type per three could reduce expression, or I'm sorry, could stabilize uh, per one and two protein levels, but that the mutant PER3 did not. So because the, <coughs> excuse me, the human subjects have seasonal affective disorder, and, and by the way, their circadian phenotype has a very strong seasonal effect as well. So they, they have stronger phase advance at a certain part of the year. I don't recall, I think it's during short photo periods. Uh, but we can't really measure depression in a mouse, but there are assays of dep depression-like behavior, and we applied several of these to these mice uh, to, to look for depression-like phenotypes. So in the tail suspension test, the mutant mice stopped moving, the, the time to immobility, the latency to immobility was shorter, and the duration of immobility was longer in the mutant mice versus, versus the wild type. Um, and this effect could be reversed by treating the mice with one uh, kind of antidepressant, imipramine, which is a tricyclic antidepressant. We still are, are in the process of testing Lexapro in these animals, which is the drug. We expect that this may have the same effect. It is a, a, a drug that helps the depression phenotype in the human subjects. But I don't want to go all th through all this data so I can get through uh, some other things, except to say that we also looked at uh, forced swim test and sucrose preference tests in the wild type, in wild type animals, in wild type transgenics, and in PER3 mutant transgenic animals, and showed that the phenotypes became much stronger, the depression-like phenotypes became much stronger when these mice were placed in a short photo period. So in that regard, it recapitulates the light sensitive phenotype of seasonal affective disorder in the humans. And so uh, quite intriguing, although we don't have any insights into downstream pathways that might be relevant to this phenotype. So there, there's a huge amount of work yet to be done in, in following this up. But uh, since I've skimmed uh, over this very quickly, I'll just say this is this was published. Loying and Arisa, uh, both fantastic postdocs. Loying's in her own lab now, and Arisa will be leaving next spring uh, to go back to Japan to a job. Um, uh, did this work? And and if you want to get more details, feel free to ask me or or take a look at this manuscript, which was published a couple of months ago. But the point here is that every uh, the reason I wanted to put this in was to to say that. Everybody believes that circadian clock and sleep and circadian timing are related to mood, but there's never been any direct uh, molecular or, or genetic uh, uh, evidence for this. And so we think that PER3 is, um, is a nexus for sleep and mood regulation. And uh, again, are interested in pursuing this into more detailed molecular understanding of the phenotypes. Now I should say also, because of time, I didn't show you all the data, but PER3, although the, the, the transgenic mice in constant darkness didn't have period shortening, they did have altered entrainment, which sleep physiologists predict could cause alterations in sleep phase. And so we think that this mutation, its effect on sleep, 
is via PER1 and uh, stabilization of PER1 and 2, but uh, that, it's, uh, that it's more the result of altered entrainment uh, so that PER3 appears to be playing a role, although we haven't formally proven this, in entrainment of the clock in uh, mice and humans. And so that's another area that we are very interested in pursuing. So Arisa Hirano, who I mentioned, also uh, pu recently published this paper. Uh, we have identified a mutation in cryptochrome 2, which is the heterodimeric binding partner of the period proteins that, tra that inhibits transcription of cryptochrome 2 gene expression and cryptochrome 1, and also uh, expression of all the period uh, genes. And again, a small family here. We only have, again, three uh, affecteds. But what was interesting is that, um, that this mutation was an alanine to threonine at position 260, which falls into the FAD binding domain. And I'll have more to say about that in a little, a, a little bit of the human CRY2 protein. There's a phosphorylation site close by, and so it's possible, although again, we haven't proven this, that this mutation might affect phosphorylation at this site. And um, this lysine is ubiquitolated and is important for cryptochrome uh, degradation, regulation of degradation. So the, the phenotype in these mice was somewhat more straightforward. In, in mice, again, we're looking at rest activity rhythms as surrogates for sleep wake and where the blue is is when the lights are on so we start animals off in light dark 12 12 so this is a 48 hour ras double raster plotted uh, data and what normal mice do what wild type mice do is they get on the wheel and run when the lights go off because they're nocturnal animals and so they're clearly awake here because they're running on a wheel and then when the lights come on, they get off the wheel, and we presume that they're sleeping uh, during this time. And, and we can show that they are sleeping for a good part of this time if we do EEG. But then when we turn the lights off and release them into constant darkness, the mice begin advancing a little each day, and the slope of this line defines their circadian period. And, and a wild type C57 black six mice, mouse has a period of 23.7 hours. And we can do populations of mice so we can do appropriate statistics. And, and these, uh, these data are always incredibly tight. That this behavior is a very easy one and a very accurate one for measuring period in mice. And what uh, Arisa showed in both, uh, in two different lines, I'm just showing you transgenic li uh, line one here, but the same was true with an independent transgenic uh, line that in this case, a single mouse, but also populations of mice, had shorter circadian period uh, when released into constant darkness. And so, and that's quantitated here. Uh, here's, uh, in the blue is a wild type transgenic, um, and the wild, uh, and the mutant transgenic uh, doesn't have uh, period lengthening that you get from overexpression of the wild type CRY2 transgene. So like the previous PER2 and CK1 delta mutants that we've identified in FASPS subjects, uh, or FASP subjects, the CRY2 uh, mutant mice also have a shorter period. Um, and this is, I, I don't worry about the panel on the left, but we show, uh, Arisa shows here that the activity offset, so this is when the mice are getting off the wheels, is earlier, this is using uh, a video tracking system because wheel running is not as accurate for measuring activity uh, onset. So she also did uh, video tracking in these experiments and showed that both the activity onset or wake, uh, waking up and activity offset, which is a surrogate for going to sleep, are uh, advanced just like in the human subjects who have uh, this FASP mutation. But what's interesting here is that this mutation also, I should say that cry protein in the flies, flies only have a single cryptochrome, is the light sensor for entrainment. We know that from beautiful fly experiments from a number of labs. Cry does not, is not known to have a light sensing function in mammals, and it actually 
seems to have a different role in mammalian clock than it does in fly clock. But what's interesting here is that with gi giving light pulses to look at sensitivity to entrainment, Arisa showed that the mutant animals entrain uh, less well to light pulses at the beginning of the mouse's day um, and didn't have much of an effect to light pulses that were given at the end of the mouse's subjective day, which is the transition from dark to light. So again, this is a, a, a mutation that does, have, does, does cause period shortening, and we think that likely contributes to the phase advance. But we also think it's likely that the altered entrainment profile would lead to the same effect and contributes to the very strong phase advance effect in these subjects. And so with uh, MEFs from the mutant and wild type control mice, it's possible for us because circadian clock is a cell autonomous property, we can measure circadian oscillation in cell culture using a, a luciferase reporter driven by a circadian gene. Um, and so here you can see f approximately four days, 96 hours of activity of luciferase e expression after we've synchronized, in, in a culture, cells are all, always oscillating in a circadian way, but they're usually completely out of phase, so if you're measuring luciferase gene expression, it's gonna be uniform. Um, but if we synchronize the cells by giving them a, a pulse of dexamethasone, and then measuring uh, luciferase uh, reporter activity over days of time, we can see oscillations that are circadian in nature. And then they dampen out and, and go to a uniform expression as, as the cells drift out of uh, phase with one another. Because not every cell is ticking on exactly, precisely the same, uh, to the precisely same circadian period. And so both mutant transgenic lines, MEFs from both mutant transgenic lines, have a period that's about an hour shorter than the wild type transgenic control mice when measured in this assay and culture. So, so we can show the phenotype in a cell-based assay, we can show it in vivo with, uh, with, with the mice. And Ning Zhang from Seattle crystallized CRY2 a couple of years ago in a beautiful nature paper. Um, and uh, what's interesting is that but we, CRY2, we know, binds to another circadian gene cloned by Joe Takahashi's lab called FBXL3. And FBXL3 is a ubiquitin ligase, and it's through interaction of FB, uh, FBXL3 with CRY2 that that lysine is polyubiquitinated, the lysine I pointed out in the, in, the, in the protein sequence, and this targets CRY2 for degradation. And of course, since this is part of a transcriptional translational feedback loop, if you alter the levels of synthesis or degradation of the repressor proteins, you can alter clock function. And our mutation, remember, falls right in the loop, uh, the FAD uh, uh, binding domain that is where FBXL3 binds to, per, uh, to CRY2. <clears throat> CRY2 proteins are also less stable, particularly in the nucleus. I won't dwell on this, but here's a model of what I just said. Uh, CRY2, when it binds to FBXL3, gets polyubiquitinated and degraded. But we know that if FAD, we can compete away this interaction, uh, as Arisa did in this experiment, with FAD, which binds in the same region that FBXL3 binds. And so in a dose-dependent way, we can compete away the interaction of FBXL3 and CRY2 leading to increased CRY2 protein levels, free CRY2 protein, because now FAD is bound to CRY2 and prohibits, competitively uh, inhibits uh, FBXL3 binding. And so you can see that in wild type CRY2 with increasing doses of FAD in the media, that there's increased CRY2, free CRY2 uh, in the supernatant, and there's Incre increasing doses of FAD will lead to more mutant uh, CRY2 in the supernatant, but less so than in the wild type because it's a less stable protein in general, I guess. <clears throat> um, so I've already really covered this, so I'm going to move on. Um, we, oh, I'm sorry, this was in uh, 
so this is the experiment looking at cry 2 protein expression. We've looked now at extra, or Arisa's looked at extracts from brain, but also uh, MEFs in culture from the mutant and control mice, and then also in liver tissue. Uh, so this is an effect that's uh, present, the destabiliz destabilizing effect of these mutations on cry 2 protein in, in, in a number of different tissues. In addition to lower cry 2 protein levels, <coughs> She showed that in liver as well and, and in the other tissues that PER1 and PER2 protein levels are increased, presumably because of decreased repression by PER3. And so here's the model. I, I haven't talked about the FBXL3 knockout mice, but when you knock out FBXL3, so they're missing this ubiquitin ligase, you have more CRY2 protein because it's not being targeted for degradation uh, as actively. In the case of wild-type mice and, and wild-type transgenic mice, FBXL3 can bind to CRY2 and that targets it for degradation, but there is also FAD present, which competes with FBXL3 and leads to stabilization of some CRY2 protein. So CRY2 levels are being regulated by the balance of degradation versus stabilization in the wild-type situation. But in the, F in the human FASP mutant that interferes with cry to FBXL3 binding, I'm sorry, it, it, it interferes with uh, FAD binding and, and strengthens the interaction of FBXL3 to cry 2 So mutant cry 2 binds more readily to wild type FBXL3, targeting uh, the cry 2 proteins for shorter or for faster degradation. And this is consistent with a shorter period and a, an advance of the phase. So it's all the data from the knockout mice, from our human mutation in mice uh, versus the wild type controls is parsimonious with regard to regulation of CRY2 levels and, and the uh, cycling of the circadian clock. So then in work that wasn't in that uh, eLife paper but that has recently been submitted by Arisa, she wanted to ask the question of whether FAD regulates protein stability directly in, in normal physiologic conditions and whether this has any relationship to metabolism because FAD is a derivative of riboflavin, vitamin B2, uh, via a pathway that I'll remind you of in a moment in another slide. <coughs> Excuse me. So now these are experiments in culture and Arisa shows that she's a, that treatment with or without FAD leads to increases in relative CRY2 protein levels, which is predicted from the model that I just showed you based on all the previous data. Um, and furthermore, when she does this in cells from uh, mutant CRY2 transgenic mice, she's able to abrogate this effect, this increase in, uh, in cry level, uh, cry protein levels is abrogated by the, the mutation which enhances binding of the cry two, mutant cry 2 protein to FBXL3. And it does that via increasing of cry 2 stability which again is completely reasonable wh when you think about the model that I, that I just showed you. And she went on to do more uh, experiments uh, solidifying this finding that FAD can, competes with FBXL3 in its binding. And, and here again, she's measuring both CRY1 and CRY2 protein released from this complex as a result of increasing doses of FAD, similar to the data I showed you before. <coughs> So the A260T human CRY2 mutation leads to uh, uh, reduced ability of FAD to compete for FBXL3 because it in increases the binding, the strength of the binding between FBXL3 and the mutant CRY2. So here's the FAD biosynthetic pathway. The rate limiting kinase, kinase is, uh, enzyme is riboflavin kinase, which uh, uh, catalyzes the reaction of riboflavin or vitamin B2 to FMN and then the second enzyme 
results in the formation of FAD. So RFK is the rate limiting uh, uh, enzyme in this, uh, uh, in this pathway and knockdown of RFK, ARISA showed, leads to decreased per, uh, CRY2 protein levels as shown here. So these are, this is, these are experiments in culture, so in vitro. And, uh, and furthermore, this decrease in CRY2 protein levels she showed with this cyclohexamide pulse chase experiment is that is, is via uh, promotion of CRY2 degradation uh, uh, as a result of, of not having as much FAD to compete with uh, FBXL3 for CRY2 binding. <clears throat> so interestingly, uh, FAD synthesis also oscillates in a circadian way, and so this is a, an interesting observation. We don't know the import of that, but, but it clearly, FAD can clearly modulate circadian period, and now again, I showed you data from uh, in vitro, uh, in vivo, and here's an in vitro experiment in cells in culture showing that increasing doses of FAD lengthen, progressively lengthen the period of uh, the cells cycling in culture. Uh, and so here's a, an in vivo experiment where uh, Arisa both knocked down, I'm sorry, the previous knockdown was in also in vitro. This is the in vivo experiment where she injected an RFK siRNA into the tail vein of the mice and also place them on a riboflavin free diet and then looked uh, over time at uh, cry expression rhythms and showed that uh, the cry levels were decreased by the knockdown in the in the nucleus of uh, in the nuclei of from liver extracts <coughs> Riboflavin, so again, this is the same experiment, riboflavin-free diet and the RFK knockdown also dampened expression of other circadian genes like CRY1, uh, its own, the endogenous gene and, and also PER1. And this is not surprising again because this is a negative feedback loop. Um, okay, in the interest of time, let me scoot through this. And I, I, I don't want to go into detail about this, but uh, Arisa was quite intrigued because as she was sampling many different uh, messages looking for uh, what uh, the FAD deficiency leads to as a metabolic output, there were a lot of metabolic genes uh, that were uh, downregulated by deficiency of FAD. So they were disproportionately affected by RFK knockdown compared to other uh, control genes. And uh, uh, that's all I'll say about this slide. Um, so glucose uh, homeostasis, and we know that metabolism is linked to the circadian clock. It's interesting, for example, that mice that are fed a, a specific amount of food only at uh, the inappropriate time of day, their night, which is the light period, they gain more weight than mice that eat the same amount of food, the exact same amount of food, but eat it during a nor more normal physiologic uh, time. So over the years now, we've collected over 100 families that have FASP. Uh, and what's remarkable is that we have population-based data showing that this phenotype, which had not been ap appreciated until we reported it first in 1999, so less than 20 years ago, yet it affects one in 200 people in the population. So if you went out to, uh, on the campus and you sampled, um, you, you did the, the workup that we do for our subjects in these studies on a thousand undergrads from UCLA, we would predict that five out of the thousand, one in 200, would have FASP. And then, if we go, in the studies that we've done up until this point over the last 20 years, if we go, if somebody, someone meets these strict criteria that we've developed over the years for making this diagnosis, and we have access to first degree relatives, parents, children, siblings, in, in a large majority of the cases, there will be an autosomal dominant pattern of transmission of that phenotype. 
So I was talking uh, with uh, another faculty member earlier this morning and just saying that like in all of genetics, if you look at the really, really strong phenotypes, that, that it's much more likely that you're going to be enriching for single gene variants of strong effect. The normal variation of sleep time preferences in this room, most of it is probably a complex genetic uh, combination of what, you know, number of alleles that we in, uh, inherited from mom, a number from dad, and they all add up to make Alcino a night owl and make me a morning lark and make, you know, other people somewhere in the middle of the distribution. Um, but, but these are strong, these are mutations of strong effect in single genes that cause an autosomal dominant and highly penetrant phenotype. Now, I, I have referred to and talked about uh, some of these, uh, the four genes now that are all published. We also have uh, one allele and two uh, mutant alleles in the CK1 epsilon, another kinase, and the timeless gene. Timeless is another really interesting gene. It was the, it's the heterodimeric binding partner of per protein in Drosophila. It is the second gene that was cloned in Drosophila circadian genetics field. And yet, when uh, David Weaver and Steve Ruppert knocked it out, this is an embryonic lethal in mice. And so everybody in the field has ignored it. They, it's treated as a non-circadian gene, as far as I can tell, in mammals, because the knockout was lethal, but, which doesn't make much sense to me. But, but we now have two human alleles that have FASP, and we have a lot of interesting data, and hopefully we'll be submitting a paper soon, proving that timeless is, uh, uh, although its function is quite different in mammals than it is in flies, it is uh, still uh, uh, a protein in the circadian clock. And so this, from a human genetics point of view, th this is one of the most exciting things I'd like to leave with you. We, we have these, this large cohort of really well-characterized families. And this is important because, the, as I said, the phenotyping is extremely labor-intensive. And, and we have to get the phenotypes as right as we can if we have any hope of being su successful with the genetics. But despite a huge amount of sequencing now over the years, we know that less than 15% of these families have mutations in, in known circadian clock genes. And so that means there's a huge amount of stuff to find yet in human phase subjects that have not been found in circadian forward genetic screens and other organisms. So, so human genetics has a lot to offer, I think, this field in terms of finding many new things that we haven't yet found in flies and, and mice. And I emphasized this earlier, like in uh, circadian genetics of flies and mice, we know that there are many um, core clock gene mutations that can alter the period. And in these cases, we think that this contributes to or is sufficient for causing the FASP phenotype in humans. But we also have interesting examples. I uh, didn't spend a lot of time on this, but with the PER3 uh, mutation and with the CRY2 mutation, where the mutation actually not only affects period length, but affects sensitivity of, of entrainment to the light, which can also contribute to the, to the phenotype. And we don't have any examples yet where mutations in clock genes have led to altered clock output coupling. But in those 85 plus percent of our unexplained, our unexplained FASP families, which we've now begun doing a huge amount of whole exome sequencing in, we hope slash expect that we are going to find novel entrainment genes. We know that entrainment and the ticking of the clock in the brain are two separate things, but they, they're also overlapping, and some of the molecular machinery is clearly shared. But there are going to be genes that contribute to entrainment of the clock that are completely separate from the core clock genes that regulate the, uh, the period, and we hope to find some of those in our whole exome sequencing efforts in the unexplained FASP subjects. And similarly, if your clock is ticking at a normal speed and your entrainment is completely normal, we also expect that the tightness of coupling of the clock to the physiologic outputs, like the sleep-wake cycle, 
could also uh, uh, be affected. And, and so we're hopeful that one or more of the genes that we hope to identify through the whole exome sequencing efforts in unexplained FASP subjects may lead to recognition of output coupling genes that change the, the tightness of the coupling of the clock to, um, to the, the physiologic output. Now, Ing Wei Fu's group also, in studies on GSK3 beta, they've proven that for the first time that GSK3 beta, like in flies, is a, is a circadian gene, that two novel targets in, this, in a large chemical genetic screen, that two targets of the GSK3 uh, uh, beta kinase are oglucnec transferase and oglucnase, and that these themselves are core clock genes. So, uh, we've not yet found mutations in these genes that cause FASP, but these are novel clock genes that have not, again, been identified in other model systems. And what's exciting about this is that OGT and OGA are a very direct connection between metabolism and the circadian clock. We've shown uh, in beautiful work in collaboration with a Andy Charles here that the CK1 delta mutations uh, are causative, I think uh, it's fair to say, of the migraine phenotype in, in patients who carry mutations in this gene, and that we, we have a um, mouse model of the, human mutation, the first human mutation, which has alterations of a number of different measures of migraine-like uh, physiology that support the notion that this is a cause, that this is, the mutations here uh, are causative for the migraine with aura phenotype. And I've shown data supporting the notion that PER3 uh, might be responsible, mutations or variants might be connected to mood phenotypes like uh, seasonal affective disorder. But this gets back to the slide that I began with, you know, that clock and sleep are critically important to everything about our physiology. We've evolved on this planet, unless you're Sarah Palin, in, in which case we have not. Um, in such a way that our metabolism and our physiology has become tuned to work maximally on a cycle where the light and dark is changing on a 24-hour basis uh, along with temperatures. And so, as I said in the very beginning, I think beginning to understand in more detail or, or the contributions that the human families have to increasing our understanding of regulation of human circadian function ultimately will have profound effects on our ability to modify many other phenotypes that are disease phenotypes like cancer, um, metabolic disorders, mood disorders, and pain disorders and others. For example, just, just as one example, I mentioned that cancer, many forms of cancer are increased in risk for people who are chronically sleep deprived or chronically out of sync with the solar day, like shift workers. The largest studies have been done in nurses who work, the female nurses who work the night shift at, chronically, and they have an increased risk of breast cancer. But there are also good studies that show that breast cancer prognosis is strongly associated, statistically significantly associated with the circadian time of day of administration of chemotherapy. Now, the cancer docs don't want to hear this because they're struggling to, you know, breast cancer is so common <clears throat> and they're just trying to, you know, serve the patients. Uh, so for them to then figure out if you're a, uh, if you're, if you have breast cancer, if you're a night owl or a morning lark and adjust your chemo to the appropriate time of day to get maximal cancer cell killing with minimal healthy cell killing, uh, that would be a nightmare from uh, the point of view of the work that it would take to treat these patients. So we envision that one day, and others too, that, that, we, that chronotherapy will become a reality. That is that if we can align the circadian cycle to the time of administration of drugs, uh, that that uh, might improve the, our, we already have great treatments. Breast cancer is a serious problem. But many women do very well. My, uh, there are many examples of people that I know who, have, who are breast cancer survivors, which is great. But if we could improve the prognosis further by sinking the, the circadian clock better with the chemotherapy, that would be a tremendous advance. And similarly, John Hoganish has shown 
in a large uh, study that, for example, the time of day of administration, that the, the benefit of aspirin, I, I don't remember what the outcome was, it, whether it was heart attack or stroke, that it, I think it was heart attack, was, was improved depending on the time of day that the, the aspirin was administered. So, so in the future, we're gonna be thinking more and more about time of day of administration. And then, because there are a lot of behavioral geneticists in the, in the audience, you know, I'll also emphasize something that we typically do behavior studies in mice in the daytime because that's when you, you, it's easier to see what the mice are doing and that's when students and technicians and PIs are in the lab most. Uh, but that's the time of day that the mice should be sleeping. So, so could we increase the power of our learning and memory, memory assays if we were doing them in the dark phase, when, uh, which is harder because it's dark, uh, when mice are supposed to be awake? That, uh, interesting question to think about. But, but thinking about timing of not only therapies but, but behavioral assays in, in mice, for example, are things that I think will change over time as we come to appreciate more and more the importance of clock and uh, uh, circadian timing and sleep in uh, behavioral outputs like this. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge uh, great colleagues. I've been working in, in this domain with my colleague, uh, Ingwe Fu, for many years. Folks in uh, my lab and hers who have done uh, work that uh, I've talked about today, Chris Jones from the University of Utah. Kayvon Shokat was a collaborator on Ingwe's project in the chemical genetics, along with Al Burlingame. And uh, I'll stop there and be happy to take questions. <laughs>